in troibo ad altare dei. Welcome to Catholic Conversations, where I'm Catholic and we are going to have a conversation. I'm Adrian Fonseca, your host, and I'm here with Alex Broussard. And uh, we're going to have a conversation about uh, St. Augustine. St. Augustine was an early church father. Uh, he's from Hippo, so it's St. Augustine of Hippo. And, well, that's where he was a bishop for a while. And uh, we'll talk about the history of St. Augustine, uh, his life, where he grew up, um, what influenced him and his conversion, and some of the uh, questions that commonly come up regarding St. Augustine and that kind of thing. Uh, Alex Broussard is a, a, will be a senior at the University of Dallas this coming year. Um, Alex, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I mean, I'm Alex Broussard. I study classical Greek and Latin philology and now math at University of Dallas. And I like to read stuff written in Latin and Greek and Augustine's a great example of that. And he's a lot of fun. And um, yeah. So uh, for those people who don't know, what is philology? Literally it means a uh, love of words. So take classics and the things you read for classics and just spend extra focus on the language stuff there. So it's kind of like someone who studies languages, that kind of. Yeah. Awesome. And so when did you decide that you um, had an affinity for St. Augustine? That's a great question. I don't know. Um, I don't think I have a particular affinity. I just have an interest in him and I started reading some of him and uh, started reading more and more. Um, I took a seminar on Augustine with a couple of professors from Catholic University of America and I took a Latin course over uh, some of his conf some selections from his confessions and also um, also his literal commentary on Genesis and I read a lot of his confessions for theology and uh, philosophy class last semester so I mean since I've been exposed to him my interest has just grown and grown and I mean he's sort of one of the quintessential examples of Christian Latin writing Hmm. And he's, I think, the most prolific Latin Christian writer of all of history. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Only, I think, second place goes to Jerome. Really? Contemporary of Augustine's. Wow. But he's written over a million words. Wow. That's insane. Yeah. Well, the, um, I know that uh, Augustine also gets the uh, award for first of memoir in, uh, in history. Yeah, so. first autobiography, I think, or at least in Western history. Right. I think that's um, interesting. Which uh, is a wonderful read. Would recommend yeah. everyone read it. Who's you know, listening. I, I think the only thing I've ever read of St. Augustine is his Confessions. Uh, I think I've read that start. like three times because it was assigned to me in the three different classes. And so I had to read it. Um, and it's a great read. And I'm just, but I'm like, why can't someone assign me something else so I can read other things? I guess I, guess I always do it in my you want. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I can do, I guess I could do it on my own, but you know, when you have a, so much time in a day, but, uh, what, what's your favorite works from St. Augustine? Um, I mean, his big three are the De Civitate Dei, the city of God, the De Doctrina Christiana on Christian doctrine and the De Trinitate on the Trinity. And these are just huge works. And so, I mean, if you have three big things you want to read of Augustine that are just like monstrous, amazing works. I mean, those are three you can definitely check out. But I think um, some of the smaller ones are more appropriate for, you know, something that isn't a two, three year endeavor. So, oh. I mean, he, he has writings like the literal commentary on Genesis, mm -hmm. which is a great introduction to reading Genesis. Um, and then some other works like his De Libro Arbitrio on free will, which is, I think one of the one of the most profoundly influential and underappreciated works of uh, Western thought, which really introduces the idea of free will into the Western canon. Um, and then maybe his work on holy virginity, which uh, tells you what he actually thinks about uh, his views on uh, human sexuality. Mm. And uh, I mean, 
a lot of people like to say things about what Augustine thought about sex and they have no idea what he actually said about sex. Yeah. So, I mean, I have no idea. So maybe it's something we can uh, dive into uh, later Absolutely. on. But if there's one thing I wanted to ask you. Are you familiar because you mentioned uh, his commentary on Genesis mm-hmm. with his angelology? No, not really. And so uh, I'm not super familiar with it because I'm only familiar with it through the writings of Thomas Aquinas because okay. Aquinas quotes Augustine uh, quite a, uh, a bit when he talks about his uh, theology of the angels. Uh, so with the idea that we say that uh, Lucifer fell and that a third of the mm-hmm. angels fell um, and that the the struggle between um, the Michael who was the who said uh, who was like God. Um, and that whole, that whole idea. And then the creation of the angels being the creating, uh, being created on the first day when they said, when God said, let there be light, uh, referring to the creation of the angels and then the separation of light and darkness mean reference to the separation of the angels and the, and the fallen angels. Um, and Thomas Aquinas credits that to Tom to, uh, Augustine. Um, and I was just curious if you're familiar with that. Uh, there's a lot of, his big three works that I haven't read still, and they might be in there. And, um, I mean, so no, I don't really know. Okay. I mean, it makes his, uh, as far as I know, his, um, his on the city of God incorporates a lot of, uh, pagan mythology and tries to explain things. So I think that's my, maybe where we get the idea is that pagan gods were actually fallen angels or devils, but I'm not yeah, super sure. I think that's, uh, St. Paul says, um, and oh, I can't remember. He says that, uh, that the, the gods of the, uh, of the pagans were our demons. And so I'm, that's probably where, uh, Augustine probably gets some of that idea from. Uh, but let's talk about Augustine's life. Okay. Uh, who was Augustine before he was St. Augustine? Um, quite the rascal. Uh, he, uh, he grew up in Thagaste. I think it's pr- the way it's pronounced Thagaste. Um, which is a city in Numidia. Um, and he was in sort of, I think, the lower parts of the upper class. So he was able to afford a, or his, his father was able to afford a proper education for him. And he thrived with that, even though he mostly hated it when he was young. Um, and if you read his confession, I'm sure you know, you read his confessions, he... Uh, um, took a very long time to sort his life out and he tried to find work as an instructor and this ended up taking him to Italy eventually and that's how he got into contact with St. Ambrose and eventually at the age of 31 uh, converted to uh, Nicene Christianity as opposed to Arian Christianity which St. Ambrose was uh, very much an opponent of um, and oh, I guess I should mention he was he was born in three fifty four and died in four thirty. Yeah, that's probably at, pretty as, uh, yeah, as significant. Bishop, <laughs> as the bishop of Hippo, which is yeah. why he's called uh, Augustine of Hippo. Mm-hmm. And the uh, in his early life, he was a very sinful man. Um, and it was always interesting to me to think about like how he was able to become a priest. Yet he would uh, he had a child. Um, do you do you know the story behind uh, that process? Well. <laughs> I guess it helped that his son, that he his illegitimate son that he had, a Deodatus, which means given by God, gift of God, he died. Mm-hmm. But he did devote. He did write a uh, a dialogue where he wrote, Augustine wrote dialogues. He wrote kind of basically in every single genre we can think of. Um, Do you think that was inspired by Plato? Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, well. Plato and the Platonists, now we call them Neoplatonists, had a profound infl- impact on Augustine. Um, I think it was the on the teacher, De Magistro, which is a, how he talks about education and knowledge as a dialogue on that. He did, one of his characters was a Deodatus. Um, but in his conversion, he eventually had a, a, a total conversion where he just wanted to devote his entire life to God. Um, and there's a scene of him flipping open the scriptures to a page of Paul where it told him to give up the sins of the flesh. And uh, this was just his emotional breakdown uh, that caught, that uh, led him to give up the, the woman who was betrothed to him and decided to devote his life entirely to 
um, not necessarily being a priest, I think, but being a celibate man who had lived just entirely for God. And then did he, um, whenever he made that decision, how did he get to that decision? Did God just like open up the skies? It was like, Augustine, you, this is me. Uh, how did he get there? Um, well, in the confessions, he talks about how he heard this voice uh, that was just like, I think it was a kid's voice. He describes it where it's just telling him, hey, open up this book. And it opened, when he opened it, it went right to the passage, I guess he needed. And that was his final conversion. Um, his life is, I mean, when you read Plato or you read Aristotle, the, the idea is if only we know enough, then we'll act good. But Augustine was one of the smartest guys ever lived. And this was before his conversion, yet he lived such a sinful life. So it, it, if there's an example of this principle being incorrect, mm-hmm. where if you just know something's wrong enough, then you'll just live a good life, mm-hmm. then... I, mean, I guess it's the the idea that um, if you, no one does anything wrong, uh, that they know is wrong. And Augustine's a, a example of the fact that that's not necessarily true. If you, you can do wrong just for the sake of doing something wrong. Yeah, Augustine, like... I don't think he knew a guy who was uh, smarter than him, with the exceptions of maybe Ambrose or Jerome. Wow, and the and yeah, so he in his life, I remember a story of the the story of the pear tree that I thought was uh-huh. like really funny when I first read it back yeah. in high school. <laughs> I was like, why is that a big deal? And then uh, reading it again in college, it's um, very colorful. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, could you tell a story? Okay, um, so this rascal. Uh, young Augustine, long wavy hair, hanging out with his buddies. Uh, they just want the thrill of doing something naughty. And um, so they decide to steal some pears. And he notes, I didn't need to steal them. I have better pears at home. I didn't even eat these pears. I threw them out. But I just loved the feeling of doing something bad. I loved the bad that I knew it was. I, lo- I loved the, uh, the fact that I saw myself falling away. And... He, uh, he would laugh at the people he would dupe and make fun of, but he knew that behind this, there were demons laughing at him because he's duping himself Mm. and he's turning away from God. That's what he liked. It's it's so crazy. He didn't like the pears, but he liked the fact that he was doing something wrong. Wow. That's, it's incredible to think about because like how often do we in our lives, um, we do something that we know is wrong and then we may regret it or we may not regret it, but we know it's wrong. And we're like, wow, we just did that act and we, uh, we yeah. can, uh, he did it because it was wrong. That's what yeah. he wanted to do it. That's crazy. Yeah. And the, and so how did he, what was uh, one of the influences? So you had, um, the St. Ambrose, uh, who else was an influence on his, uh, conversion? Well, absolutely. His mother who, uh, Aside from a few incidents when she was a uh, servant where she would uh, start to take progressively larger and larger sips from a, a wine barrel, um, she would pray every single day for her son's conversion for years. And it took many years because he didn't actually convert until he was 31. Um, but eventually her prayers were probably the most profound thing. And there was a story of, she went to a bishop, I can't remember who it was, maybe it was Ambrose, but I'm not sure. She went to this bishop begging for advice, and the bishop must have gotten annoyed or something, because he rebuked her saying, there's no way that the child of such tears can be lost forever. And so she took hope in that, and I guess he was right. Um, And speaking of uh, his mother, uh, what was his relationship with the Blessed Mother? Um, He doesn't write about Mary that much. Um, I've seen snippets of things in secondary literature where people have said, oh, he writes this or he doesn't write this or where he does write about Mary. Um, This isn't actually his writings. It's a spurious thing attributed to him. Mm. Um, The fact was that he was a Roman Catholic bishop. I mean, a Latin father. Um, And the year after his death, 431, was the start of the Council of um, Ephesus, where they they declared Mary the Theotokos, the mother of God. And so he, um, yeah, in the things I've read, I've not actually come across 
discussion of Mary. Hmm, interesting. But yeah, and, I'm, I'm trying to find it, I guess. Yeah. The other interesting thing is um, the, the there's actually a uh, claim that he's not a Roman Catholic bishop. Um, I've heard uh, mm. that from a for many Protestants that he was uh, that the Roman Catholic Church um uh, was not that he was not a bishop of the Roman Catholic Church. He was, uh, ju- he was, I guess, some people say he's a, a Calvinist, some people say he's a Lutheran, uh, in terms of his theology and and uh, philosophy. Um, so how, how do you can how can you say this guy is not is a Roman Catholic? Um, because I look at the alternatives, I mean, Luther wouldn't come around for Luther and Calvin wouldn't come around for a thousand years, and Frankly, if you read his stuff, he he rebukes the alternatives quite often. You have Manichaeanism, which he actually tried for a while, but eventually got sick of because he found that their you know their smartest guy Faustus didn't actually know what he's talking about. Um, Nicene or or sorry, um, Arian, so non Nicene Christianity existed, but the guy who converted him to Real Christianity um, was Ambrose, who is the most anti-Aryan guy you can get, who, uh, story goes, well, story, it's what happened. Um, he was pressured into giving up two, cer- two churches in Milan to the Aryans, and he stood his ground and just camped out in these churches and wouldn't let them get it, and he won. Wow. Um, I mean, you have Donatists who were... Uh, group of people who said that the sacraments were invalid if um an, a sinful guy gave you the sacrament so baptisms who were done by bad people were invalid which i mean augustine explicitly calls them outside the church mm. um and that, that would be this same because uh, at the time it was uh, what the the neo-pelagians um well the pelagians were something different which he also um combated. I mean, a lot of people like to say he was Pelagian, mm. um, which is kind of silly because he condemned Pelagianism. Uh, the misunderstanding, I think, on the side of some Protestants might be, um, or I guess Catholics, anyone who thinks that he was Pelagian, is that he doesn't tell you you can earn your your transformation, he doesn't tell you you can earn your becoming a saint. What he does talk about is the transformative power of grace. He's called the doctor of grace for a reason. And grace is what um, causes you to become a better person. There's no way that outside of God you can be transformed or saved. So if uh, so, when Augustine talks about grace, does he refer to grace? How does he um, quantify grace? Does he, say, does he talk about it in a quantitative way or a qualitative way? How, what is his language of grace? Uh I don't really know how to answer that. Uh, there's no grace units or things right, like that's that. What I'm, that's why it's a, a very um, tricky question whenever you talk about uh, God's grace working in someone's life. Uh, I mean, um, colloquially, we'll say things like you have more grace or God gives you such great grace and things like that. But like, how do we what is the theological language or philosophical language of grace? Well, I'll give you an example from his work on holy virginity. Um, certain people are given different graces because people have different kinds of lives, but it's not as if there's one great life and all the rest are bad. There are different kinds of graces. So he says that, um, say a married couple living chastely, um, you know, that's, that's definitely a good thing. They are having kids, raising them being a witness of the virtue of uh, chastity within a marriage. But he says that there are other graces as well and that there are higher graces like uh, living as a a celibate, um, like a monk. Um, By the way, at this time, celibate did not equal priest because you would have lay people who were celibate, lay people who were married, priests who were celibate and priests who were married. They kind of overlapped. Um, Of course, the greatest grace is being a martyr I mean, that's kind of your one-way ticket to heaven. 
Hmm. Yeah. So the, not everyone's given that grace. Interesting. Um, and so when you were talking about the, the Augustine's language, uh, or his theology on, uh, or what did Augustine think about sex in general and how many people get it wrong. So, um, what, what does Augustine say about, uh, sexual, uh, relations and his theology, I guess, on sex or philosophy on sex? Well, his opinion kind of changes over time. And I guess understandably because his conversion was conversion away from. So walk me through that. Where did it start? Where did it end? Um, who that's a really long story. That's his whole confession. That's the whole first uh, nine books of his confessions. Uh, I guess it starts when he gets, when he reads Cicero's, uh, I think it's called Hortensius, which we don't have, but it's a, it's this, uh, work on philosophy and it introduces Augustine to the philosophical life. And, uh, in his pursuit of truth, he comes to Manichaeanism, which is this weird fusion religion of Eastern stuff and some Christian stuff. And he gets pretty into it, but he, uh, rejects it for various reasons. Um, then he finds a different philosophical school, uh, which is called Platonism, but really it's Neoplatonism as it came to be known to us since I think the last century. Um, and he says that in, in this school, he found every single truth except those which were divinely revealed by the scriptures. And so in his trying to find better teaching jobs around the Roman Empire, he eventually got to Milan, where he was introduced to uh, Ambrose. And he was just amazed by this guy's learning and his, well, example, as everyone else was. Um, and the fact that Ambro Ambrose was educated really helped because if he wasn't and he couldn't hold a intelligent conversation, he might have rejected uh, the Nicaeans like he rejected the uh, Manichaeans. But he was able to actually get to know Ambrose and this influence and of course the grace of God led him to finally be baptized. Yeah. Cause the first time he talks about like he first time he read the Bible, he said this was garbage. Yeah. He was like, this is not good literature. And, uh, that's a great point. But he, he realized that this Bible and he says it in the De Doctrina Christiana is the most eloquent and holds the, the most wisdom of anything. So the day Doctrina Christiana is trying to tell you, hey, it's okay to use rhetoric and philosophy, but the most important thing is the scriptures because that's just the best. Speaking of which, um, another thing that I hear often is that uh, Aqu that not Aquinas, that Augustine uh, was sola scriptura. Um, and is there any <sighs> evidence for that or any evidence against that? Or is that even a topic that even came up at the time period? I mean, I ask what someone who believes in Sola Scriptura means by that, but um, if you want to find a better example of, I guess, mainstream Protestant Sola Scriptura, you might look at St. Jerome, who uh, was a bit hostile to the, uh, quote, deuterocanonical books, end quote. He didn't really want to translate them because they weren't in Hebrew, so I've heard. Um, but Augustine says, okay, so he what he found uh, appealing at first about the Manichaeans was he would point out how silly the, the normal Christians were with all their weird things they had to believe. But he writes in, uh, writes in the literal commentary in Genesis, sort of as a jab near the beginning. Um, these guys tell us to discard the silly things supposedly in our religion, but then you have to substitute their even more ridiculous things. Because Manichaeans have all these weird names for different entities and stuff. Speaking of which, for people who don't know, what the heck is a Manichaean? Um, a Manichaean is a follower of this guy named Mani. Um, I think he might have been from the third century. But he ended up having this weird mystery religion with different levels of an in initiation and all these different entities but the, the, the main thing that Augustine was against in his philosophical writings was the idea that there was a dark counterpart to God. Like, you have the good God, the bright God, and, the, and then the evil counterpart. But uh, Augustine then would say, no, there isn't a bad 
counterpart to God because God's the creator. Why would he create and how could he create? I, sh- I shouldn't say that. I should be more careful with my language. He would obviously, there's no way this being could exist because, I mean, God is creator of everything. He's in charge of everything. And so if there's any evil, it's actually privation, not a positive, negative, not a positive force of evil. So he was denying this like dualistic idea of yeah, God. Precisely. Um, and so the, um, I guess the idea would be something along the lines of that if God exists and we look at it philosophically speaking, because I guess he, since he was a Platonist, he would have um, the idea that God is, he means that he must be good as Aquinas proves um, and in his summa, oh, um, this is getting a bit spicy because the language of the Neoplatonists is very different than the oh, language really? of the, uh, than the, uh, people like Aquinas, uh, cause the you Aristotelians? might, yeah, the Aristotelians, um, well, because when the, co- the context of the language is different for one. And so when a, a Platonist following from really early mathematicians like Pythagoras, you know, Nice whole integers were good things because there's a story of a Pythagorean disciple being executed or murdered for finding that square root of two is irrational. <laughs> um, so, because they were trying to get this right triangle with sides of one, and then they found that the hypotenuse was square root of two, and it's irrational because there's no way you can represent it with two whole numbers as a fraction. And so, this is a big no no, so they killed him. <laughs> uh, and you can prove it. And some, I suppose he did. Um, That's hilarious. But also with the, uh, you can't eat legumes if you're a Pythagorean. So no beans or... What? Yeah, it's, it's a really weird religion. But the idea that whole was good was profoundly influential. And it got to Plato through Parmenides. And so for the Platonists, what was good was necessarily finite. Because a whole number is just what it is to the exclusion of being other things. Mm, so infinite okay. things were actually um, bad. And so when we're talking about beings as good, what we mean is these finite beings, these forms, which are only themselves, not other things, and completely themselves. These are what's good. So that's being. What, the, what Plato started to get was this being beyond being. You can see that. In, and that's what his idea of the forms. Now, the forms are what comes from this being beyond being. Oh, okay. You have this thing beyond that, which Plato kind of gets into in like the Republic a little bit, book six. Like the sun is sort of the being beyond being and the things that are below that are the forms. But the guy who really develops this is um, Plotinus, who is a third century, I think, third century disciple of the Platonic school. And he talks about this ineffable, ineffable meaning undescribable um, thing beyond being which is in not pure actuality, but pure potentiality mm, from which everything comes. So then, um, and what's the distinction between saying that something is pure actuality versus saying pure potentiality? Well, because, um, cause when we say that God is like omnipotent, we say that we mean that he is, uh, capable of all things. He has potentiality to do all things. Yeah. Um, so the three fundamentals of, Neoplatonism from Plotinus, there are three what are called hypostases or the building blocks, the three entities, sort of, that's a careless word. The three underpinnings, let's use that. You have the one, which is this being beyond being. Then you have the mind, which comes from this. Emanate is the word that's used. And then from that, you get the the soul, the world soul, in which nature is in the lower part of. Um, the beings are found within the second part, the the mind. It's comparable to the demiurge in, the, in Plato's Timaeus, the all worker. Um, but the the point of these beings and all things beneath the one which emanates continuously, importantly, it's not like a clockwork maker, but all of creation, and I think we all Catholics hold this to right now, like, um, creation is a continuous thing. If God stopped creating for an instant, it's not like creation could persist without God's right. continuous creation. And so Plotinus calls the emanation from the one, um, like a, like a stream, which never lets up. It's always flowing out. Interesting. Okay. And so, but the point is 
with these beings, you have a thing which it is and which it is not. This is a distinction. It's a duality. But the one is one specifically. So if you have this distinction, then you really violate the nature of the one. Because knowledge is, has a subject and an object. So we can't even say that the one knows. All we can do really is approach things through a negative way of discussion. All we can say is the one is not. And so, so you say, it, you can, th- what you mean by that is that you can talk about this one, uh, which we're calling God, uh, in a negative sense. You say that he's not this, he's not that, but well, you can't the, actively say that Well, what the sort of call God, and just, this, is, this is an idea that was profoundly influential. I don't want to just say that, because Plotinus was not a Christian. Right, okay? right. But a lot of his ideas were extremely influential on lots of thinkers. And it's a via negativa way of talking about the one uh, influenced Augustine. And it was extraordinarily influential on uh, Christian mysticism, like Pseudo Dionysius, the Areopagite, who talked about the via negativa and his mystical theology and his other works. And so, uh, how did all of that influence Augustine? Um, well, he finally got to a, a philosophy that he found uh, self consistent. And, like, this is, he thinks that with this he found the truth. Um, so it was, it was something very different than when he became introduced or let's say people can become convinced that God exists through logical arguments. There are large logical arguments that exist. Um, but it's a different thing with faith. Um, you have to have faith in certain things. Like you have to have faith that the Trinity is the Trinity. The Trinity. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 it's these mysteries. There's no really logical way to convince someone of a mystery. Mm-hmm. You have to believe it. And so this is the step he takes after becoming, well, rather Neoplatonic with the scriptures. Because, I mean, um, I mean, to believe that God became man is rather absurd if you mm-hmm. think about it from a, position where we don't take our own position for granted. Right. I was talking to uh, a few podcasts ago uh, with my friend Emily and in it, we were talking about how radical it is that uh, God would become man. It would be like if man became a bug to save bug kind. Um, it's just radical. It just and not only sense. that God died. Right. What? Like that's just the stumbling block to the Greeks. Mm-hmm. As Paul says, it's so. a, the uh, scandal of the incarnation. Um, so yeah, yeah. It, it is a radical <laughs> thing to believe in. Um, and so yeah, the, him being able to take that leap from that point to this point is quite, uh, insane. And so when, once he was here, he ended up doing a lot for the church and founding a lot of things, uh, that we live to today. And so a lot of people know that, um, I'm thinking about becoming a Dominican and I'm pretty sure I probably will apply, um, in May, but the, the Dominican lifestyle, um, has roots an Augustinian lifestyle. And yeah. so the, uh, the, uh, the Dominicans got their, um, rule from obviously St. Dominic who mm-hmm. got it from, uh, the Norbertines who got it okay. theirs from, uh, Augustine. Yeah. And so That's, are you familiar with the, uh, with his rule of life? Um, yeah, I think most people are introduced to a, a Catholic rule from monasticism. They know the rule of St. Benedict, which is extremely long and detailed. The rule of St. Augustine, on the other hand, is nice and short and quite simple. Um, I say that his introduction, his introdu- introductory remarks are, um, they kind of outline the purpose of the life. So let me, he says in the prologue, before all things, dearest brothers, God ought to be loved. Prologue one. And then he says, first, because you are gathered into one, Live as of one soul in the house and have one soul and heart in God. This is kind of the purpose of mask living. You're one community with one soul, one heart, one mind. Um, and what a lot of people might not know about Augustine, even if they did know he wrote a rule, was that he lived in three different monastic communities. I did not know that. Um, the last one was when he was a bishop. Before that, when he was just a presbyter, it's a priest. But before that, when he was Manichae. Really? Yeah. The way that philosophical 
pagan philosophical, I don't know, organizations, schools worked was, um, they, that's sort of the inspiration for early inspiration, uh, for Western communal living, because it's like the peripatetics, which were the people who followed Aristotle, the Epicureans, the followers of Epicurus, the Stoics, um, the, I don't know about the cynics, but they all had their own dress. They all lived in community. They all worked and they all talked with each other. And, um, yeah. So the Manichaeans, likewise. Hmm. And then, so Augustine, where does he, does he, where does he take his influence for when he writes his own rule? Um, well, obviously his experience living in monastic communities and trying to incorporate the truths that he knew about the ideal Christian life, which was the celibate lifestyle, um, which lived totally for God. Um, I should say that he does, Augustine says that all created things can be enjoyed, but the only way to enjoy them properly are to love God first and then enjoy these things as part of creation. Um, we just had a feast day today or yesterday of a married couple who, uh, I can't remember their names. No, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, the point, the thing going around Facebook is like, they love God first and then each other. And because of that, they're love for each other was the greatest it could be. And that's extraordinarily Augustinian. And so the, uh, since Augustine lived in monastic life, how does one live in a monastic life as a bishop? I don't understand how that works. I mean, I guess it may be different in the 300s than it is today. Um, but it doesn't seem like bishops have that opportunity. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem like that. And I think that's something that... It's a big problem in the church today is that we've sort of left people to live as stranded on islands, not in community. Everyone needs community. We're communal creatures. I mean, uh, the good thing about living in a mass community is you can spend your whole time striving to be holy and you have your friends who are, have the same objective helping you out. And that's the Aristotelian ideal friendship. Oh, I never thought about that. Yeah, you're right. It is. Wow. I never never put those two two things together. Um, and I just looked it up. Um, so today is July 12th, and today is the feast day of uh, Saints Louis and Saints Zelia Martin, uh, a married couple who are saints. And you're right. They um, the were live the ideal of the first commandment being love God with your whole heart, mind and soul. Yep. And then the second commandment being like unto it to love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, the, that idea is, uh, really, uh, prevalent for, uh, the saints obviously, but, uh, apparently for, uh, specifically Augustine and his, uh, rule of life. Yeah. And, um, in his writing on the free will, he, let's, well, in, in the city of God, he talks about the libido dominandi, and then he talks about libido in the daily bro arbitrio as being, and that means, uh, sorry, on, on free will, on free will. Okay. So libero free arbitrio arbitration. Okay. Um, he talks about libido, not just being, you know, like our English term for libido, but libido is any desire for something that's improper. And so for Augustine, a libido is desiring something, anything over God. And so if something takes the priority in your life, which isn't God, then it becomes a libido. And what Augustine found out was we, as sinful creatures, often choose things that we shouldn't choose, and we know we shouldn't choose. This is um, sort of our fallen condition. We're tempted to do this. Um, and the reason I said the, the De Libro Arbitro was so amazing when I was reading it was the Aristotelians didn't know this because if you read the Nicomachean Ethics, um, knowledge tends to lead to virtue. Aristotle's treatment of what he calls the incontinent man, which is the man who does something he knows to be wrong, he doesn't know what to do with. 
He just treats it very briefly and throws it away. Hmm. I mean, what was this? What was this will? I mean, Weird. So, because he didn't have an idea of concupiscence, uh, that tendency towards sin, that um, our like a fallen nature, original sin. Well, Aristotle might contribute, might attribute that to someone that's just being stupid, or Plato. You uh-huh. just don't know. But if you educate someone enough, then they would know. Or if they can't be educated, or they still are sinful, then they're just. Plato might say he's if he believed his own noble lie that these this person was a bronze souled individual and not worthy to be a ruler, or um, Aristotle might say he's a natural slave if there was one, or just someone who's not fit to be a philosopher. Hmm. Interesting. So yeah, it took a long time to figure that out. <laughs> wow. And it's, it just seems so natural to attribute in the Catholic uh, intellectual tradition. We take so many things for granted. Yeah. Um, that so many giants before us had to build up to mm-hmm. uh, the things that we take for granted, uh, especially things like concupiscence and original sin. That yeah. idea that um, we need supernatural grace as well as uh, the building of virtue by um, our act and by learning but also, and I would argue most importantly, there's supernatural grace. Yeah. And this, this conflict between reason and will doesn't just stop there. I mean, it can, it continues through all time and we still have this conflict today, but it came to a big head in the end of the middle ages. Uh, but that's another story. All right. So the, let's move on to a, something I'm uh, curious about Okay, um, because I haven't, uh, I was looking for, and I haven't, I wasn't able to find anything on um, Augustine's relationship with the Bishop of Rome. Um, oh. is that something that came up ever or was that just not a non-issue? Um, I don't, I haven't read enough to tell you, but I, th- the city of Milan was more important just politically and economically than the city of Rome at this time because Rome had just turned into a total slum, but Rome was still, sounds a- familiar, <laughs> 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 but um, that's why Ambrose was like so powerful. Um, but Rome was, and you can read a lot of different early church fathers like Clement, Ignatius, um, and Irenaeus. They all talk about Rome as, uh, the ideal church, the, uh, the first in charity. Um, this is the church, which is the model because it, one, it's so early. It's one of the first communities. Um, two, it was also one of the most persecuted. Um, so it's the example of the highest of virtues. Um, three, it is, it's a church founded by, um, the rock of the church, Peter. Mm -hmm. And it's not as if there wasn't a Pope because there was a Pope. Um, but we don't, they didn't have at the time something like we have today of a, a universal bishop mm-hmm. because this was this is before even the uh, Chalcedonian schism in the in the four fifties um, Augustine because Augustine died four thirty because you had your schism with the Coptic Church in four fifty and then or four fifty something and then you had your schism with the East uh, formally at ten fifty four and so whereas the Bishop of Rome was the first in honor there were other patriarchs, so to say, in places like Alexandria or um, Antioch. Hmm. And then the, and then Augustine's, uh, whenever he was in relation with, uh, as a bishop to his brother bishops, did, uh, at the time of his life, was, did he have a special uh, place in terms of his relationship with the other bishops or was he just one bishop amongst many? Um, I don't know. Okay, that's a good answer. Uh, the someone who did have a close relationship with the Pope was actually Jerome. Really, um, Jerome was uh, he was told to uh, compose the Vulgate by the Pope. I can't remember his name, and then he was told to keep in. I think the I think he was told to keep in the Deuterocanonical books by the Pope. Hmm. And so, because of the Pope's control over the West at this time, even this early time, then that became the basis for the scriptures used throughout the West for, um, thousand years. And so, then continuing so did later. Augustine, um, have Deuterocanonical in his Bible? Um, well, from what I've read of his writings, he used the, what's called the old Latin, the, uh, which is a very badly written translation 
of the uh, the Greek scriptures and then okay. Old New Testament. So since it's a bad, since the Septuagint did have these books, um, then, and it was, the Septuagint was treated as divinely inspired. Mm -hmm. I think he would have. I haven't read enough of his writings to okay. see any specific treatment of his, of the Deuterocanonical books. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, nothing I read suggests he... Uh, Denied it. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, what, but what he, I mean, go back to what he said about the Manichaeans. They had, the Manichaeans had their own books. Mm -hmm. And he just said they were ridiculous because you're telling us to disregard these books held by the church, but you want us to use your own books? That's kind of dumb. Yeah. Like you, you've got to use the books used by the churches. Yes. You don't it's get kind your of own a, books. It's kind of a, a, oh, how do you say, uh, I guess a double standard. Um, the main yeah, key it's, having. A, it's a totally different standard. Like you can't just call our things ridiculous and then use even more ridiculous things. <laughs> yeah, anyway. With the, in regard to his, uh, works on the city of God, um, the City of God, uh, so I've never actually read his book on City of God, and so it's on my list of books I need to get to. In his book, um, what is his distinct distinction between the City of God and the City of Man? What is he, what is he talking about? Is it heaven and earth? Is that what he's referring to? Sort of. Um, obviously, everyone in heaven is in the City of God, but the City of God is those who are, in a way, living as if they were in the city of God. So holy, the city of God, it belongs to those who put God first and live a holy lifestyle. Um, the city of man or the uh, Chivitas Terena, the city earthly, is the city which belongs to those who favor other things over God. They have libido. Um, and he says, well, most people outside the church, well, I should say people outside the church for Augustine were in the city of man, but also there were people inside the church who didn't in fact put God first. Mm -hmm. And so, and so his hey, idea, so he was, so did he think that you could be part of the city of God, um, while still here on earth? I think so. Mm -hmm. I mean, people who are baptized Christians and living the holy lifestyle. Yeah, I think so. And then that leads to his, the seven sacraments. Did he, um, write much about the seven sacraments and talk about the seven sacraments? Um, the familiarity I have with that is his writings against the Donatists mm -hmm. who were saying that the, uh, the sacraments were non-existent because they were performed by or done by people who were unholy. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's where his defense of the sacrament really shines forth as you know, these things themselves are special and efficacious regardless of the sinfulness of the person because everyone's sinful. And so, I mean, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, at the time period, uh, I know that the sacraments, um, we, there were some people who actually argued that there were more sacraments than seven. Uh, so there are some communities to believe that foot washing was a sacrament. Hmm. And I believe, I uh, that it was around the time period of Augustine where the seven sacraments were officially been like, um, these are the seven sacraments, but it wasn't until almost the scholastic period where it was, uh, completely dogmified where it was like, these are the seven sacraments, uh, no more, no less. And, uh, these are uniquely the sacraments in there. You can have things that are holy, things that point towards things that are good, like, kind of like icons in the East where they're mm -hmm. considered as lowercase s sacraments. Um, what we would probably refer to as sacramentals, um, yeah. And so, yeah, the, that idea, I was, I'm just curious about, um, Augustine's writing or what he, uh, would talk about and maybe like the Eucharist, things like that. Um, his, uh, yeah. Theology on the sacramentology and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm really not sure about the history of the sacraments, um, and his writings on it so much. So, hmm. and mm -hmm. the other thing is the relationship between Augustinians and, uh, and Thomist. Oh. Uh, so what is that, uh, that budding of heads? Um, I mean, I'd say it's mostly Thomists who don't understand Augustine, but Thomas himself cites Augustine all the time as a... Yeah, uh, Thomas cites Augustine more than anyone else. And Okay, so, I mean, you wouldn't have Thomas without Augustine, I'd say. I would agree with that, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, but, uh, I mean, I was, Augustine is the church father of the West, I mm -hmm. think it's fair to say. Yeah, I agree. 
And that's why I was always confused why there always seems to be a butting of heads between Augustinians and Thomists. Like, what is what is the disagreement that maybe, they have? Maybe it's the extremely crass, unsophisticated um, comparison. It's like, well, Augustine is to Plato and Thomas is to Aristotle. Mm-hmm. When, I mean, the Aristotle that Augustine could get his hands on, he absorbed and used all the time. Like... When he was young, um, Augustine got his hands on the categories and he just consumed it and was profoundly influenced by the writings of Aristotle we could get. Um, it's unfortunate that in the West we didn't really have the writings of Aristotle until much later, mostly mm-hmm. through the Islamic world. Yeah, the uh, and then many... Um, Islamic and Jewish world, the Arab-speaking world. Yeah, uh, the Semites... The but yeah the so Thomas um, in his writings often refers to uh, Augustine and almost as like the authority whenever he quotes uh, anyone uh, but and then he also will use uh, Aristotle as probably uh, two of the most famous examples of appeals to authority that he uses yeah um, which I always thought was interesting because uh, Aquinas in a different treatise has also talked about how he thinks that appeal to authority is a fallacy and is a, a one of the worst ways to argue for something uh, so I just think it's kind of funny how he does it anyways because he knows that appealing to authority is important um, while at the same time just because it's someone is authority doesn't mean that they're right well I, I mean I'm not here to defend Aquinas but <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh uh he normally does so with a reason. And if the reason's not in the writing itself, he explains it more. I guess you're talking about the Summa. Right. And so, but in some of his other writings, like his biblical commentaries, he'll cite Augustine all the time because mm-hmm. Augustine just wrote about everything. And, and he also cite other people like Chrysostom. Yeah. And I mean, when, when he offers, when there are different interpretations, he might side with one or the other. But I mean, I think like, because he wrote so much and because it was so early on and he didn't have all this craziness in the Scholastic Age, we really have a lot of his stuff he wrote. Mm-hmm. And it was preserved pretty well. And that's why I think he's just, like, so influential. Is there things that Augustine wrote that are lost to time? Mm, don't know. I guess we won't know because know. it's lost. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we know, like, we don't have the Timaeus. Right. I mean, what Augustine wrote, we have tiny sections, so I don't ever really know that. What I do know is we just have a ton of stuff of his. Mm-hmm. And the, what is the, and whenever you're thinking about Augustine, what was something that you're like, if someone needs to know about Augustine, what did, what do they need to know about him? Um, that he's probably one of the most brilliant men who ever lived and one of the most influential men on in the whole of Western Christianity. And then what are the things that he taught uh, that people should know or people that, that you would want people to learn about if you were like, you have a, who I'm talking a few to. minutes and you're like, uh, you have a group room full of people and you have five minutes to tell them about some kind of teaching on Augustine. Uh, what would be the thing that you want to talk to them about? Is it a room of Catholics? Yeah. Okay. They should read their Bible more. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Cause I mean, the stereotype is kind of true and the Bible is, the ultimate source of eloquence and wisdom and the inspired scriptures are true. Hmm. And the, so whenever we talk about uh, the church fathers, the church fathers tend to be the living in their time. And we have to look at them in the context of which uh, they would lived in. And so sometimes people will accuse um, Augustine of being too Pelagian and the other times they accuse him of being too Donatist. Um, oh, but, yes. so I, don't, I don't know if anyone has called him a Donatist, but people have sometimes called him Pelagian. Yeah. And I'm, I'm careful to talk about the church fathers as this, as a group. group. I mean, if something is said by all the church fathers, uh, without, you know, if, if, if one thing is proposed by all of them and agreed by all of them, pretty likely we should take it as true, mm-hmm. but there's disagreements between them. And I don't know enough about all the church fathers, but uh, I don't know. It grinds my gears when someone says the church fathers say like, well, who? Yeah. Which one? Tell me, give me a specific citation. And, yeah, exactly. And so that's why I don't know a lot of stuff and I read a lot of things about Augustine, but I'm really hesitant because like I'm reading commentaries on uh, Augustine, and they said, oh, well, he he said the normal Catholic position. 
I'm like, like, what was that? Really? I mean, prove it. Like, wh- where did he say that? I mean, also define normal Catholic position, like normal Catholic in the 300s, normal Catholic today. Yeah, it's normal. Um, it's normally today. And define like, normal. Like Augustine was just a normal, you know, he basically said everything we said. Yeah, and that's and the other thing, though. With, you saw that with Catholics and with Protestants and I mean. Yeah. Well, the other thing is the other problem is, is to try and define what they mean by a, a normal Catholic, especially because like when you say normal, do you mean a someone who is affirming the teaching of the church or normal as in the majority of Catholics? Well, I mean, so a big controversy is the issue of grace or predestination. And I, I think the reason it's such a controversy is because so many um, early Protestant reformers um, took Augustine as, and they were influenced by Augustine, took him as inspiration and predestination mm-hmm. was such a big issue, especially, well, for the Calvinists especially. And I mean, I have a ton of Augustine I need to read, especially these big three works. I've not read any of them in the, their entirety. Um, but like, I haven't come across this issue. And then when I read a Protestant who's trying to say Augustine is his, then he'll say, Augustine said this. And if we're a Catholic who said, Augustine said this about predestination, I'm like, you just tell me what you, th- what you're saying. You said, I don't believe you. <laughs> yeah. Like citation needed. Yeah. So yeah. Cause it, it's quite, um, common to hear that, uh, when, especially when talking about predestination to say that Augustine believed in a uh, double predestination, double predestination uh, and, that, like, that God willed that some people would go to heaven and God willed that certain people would go to hell, um, through his active will. And I get, that's a, a very uh, intense topic uh, to talk about, especially at a close of, uh, of the last five minutes of the podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, but do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I wish I have read more Augustine. I still, I think I'll always wish that. And I don't know how to answer it because I've not come across it independently. Mm-hmm. And so what's your, what's the next thing that you want to read about from Augustine? Um, the next thing is, I guess I'll probably try to finish the city of God. Mm-hmm. How big is the city of God? Um, big. I've seen I mean, the, the, uh, in size and it's like I, as far as my hands and my fingers will go apart. But like, is it like more than 500 pages or? I mean, I guess it depends on the print size and the, the language. Yeah. Uh, oh, do you, do you read them all in Latin or how do you read them? That's what I do. You read them in Latin. Mm-hmm. Darn it. I want to read it in Latin. I want to read anything in Latin. My Latin's so bad. Well, I, I guess you can't go wrong reading Augustine. And, um, well, I think Augustine is probably after the golden age of Latin, one of the best Latin writers who ever lived Yeah, next to, next to Jerome. Cause Jerome, I think knew the classics better than Augustine did. Jerome had in a dream, someone accused him of, he was more of a Ciceronian than a Christian. And that freaked him out for the rest of his life. <laughs> um, but like his, his writing is just exquisite and, it's just, it's so good. And what, uh, is there any prayers from Augustine that you, uh, like cling to? I think in prayers, I like, I don't know, but when I read the confessions, like the opening of the confessions, mm-hmm. like greatly are you to be praised. Um, like that's just any, anytime nature or anything just seems extraordinary and you want to thank God for the extraordinary creation of his, like that's a good one to go to. But also I think in book 10 of the confessions, when he had, when he says something about late, have I loved you? Oh, beauty. So old and so new. Like that's just some of the, that's one of the, some of the best stuff ever written. And so in any of that, any of the uh, quotes from Augustine that you're, that you memorize like in Latin, are you just like, I, you, I, I try, but, uh, Magnus, I uh, can't do it now because I'm on the spot. Magnus es domine et laudabilis valde. Greater you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. Like it's, I try and, but. Do you whatever. go to the Trinitine Mass? That's off topic. Yeah, yes, I know. Yes, I just, yes, I just I thought go, about I it. I go to the Trinitine Mass, yeah. Okay, I was just curious because I'm like, if I knew, Not every if Sunday, I knew Latin, but, okay, because I go to the Trinity Mass every Sunday, and I'm like, man, it would be so cool to be able to go to go to Trinity Mass and be and like have a really good readability in Latin. Uh, well, I'd say that, I mean, I don't know if I know Latin. I know a lot of people who are classicists don't know Latin because mm-hmm. what they what we do is largely in schools we only read the 
the real stuff people say, like, you can't read the scriptures, you can't read Augustine, he's too late. You have to just read Cicero. And yeah. because it's so complicated and you've never actually read children's book versions of Latin before, mm -hmm. not that you should read this fake stuff, but you never actually tried to read quantities of material, you never actually gotten real practice in a language, you, you, you've you ended up only reading a few pages of stuff you don't really understand. Interesting. And so, like, all these, I'm just sort of ranting about classics, but you, these professors, some of them will say, oh, the Bible's not real Latin, not real Greek. Huh. Then you... Then you go up to their students, give them a random passage from the scriptures. They can't read it. Like, okay. Like, <laughs> congratulations, you know to, Latin. Yeah, like, uh, I thought this wasn't real Latin. Like, you can't even read this simple stuff. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, my concern, um, especially, is the idea that it's uh, defining what real Latin is. It's been since uh, Latin has been kept alive by the yeah. church. Um, and pre-Vatican II, I mean, even at Vatican II itself, Vatican II, all the uh, bishops could only speak in Latin if they were going to present a a, a uh, document. Yeah. So I'm like, how cool would it be to be able to have like, sp like speakability in Latin, be able to write a speech in Latin and speak it or answer questions in Latin? A that, few, that's a few so people, cool. I mean, the people I studied with at CUA, both of them could do all of those things. That is so cool. That is and so cool to me. I like would love to do that. Before I met them, I'm like, I didn't think this existed anymore. Right? But I, yeah, it, no, it, I mean, unlike ancient Greek, Latin still lives or yeah. lived a lot longer. Yeah, I, I really hope that there's going to be a resurgence for that because in uh, canon law, actually, it says that uh, the two things that all seminarians uh, have to learn is Thomas Aquinas and Latin. Those are the two things that are listed. And I'm like, do we do either of those anymore? Um, I guess some some uh, seminaries uh, do Aquinas and they do like a semester or two in Latin. Yeah, it's um, not really learning Latin. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's a language. You can't, you, you don't know a language if you don't practice it. Right. And if you only take a class on it to try to translate, you're not really reading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I took two semesters of Latin and I'm like, wow, I know almost nothing. Um so very, very close to nothing. I've taken many semesters and I don't think I really started to get it until I started to just try to read mm -hmm. quantities of material, not necessarily hard, hard stuff, mm -hmm. but just quantities of material and language and just try to treat it like anything else. It's not some crazy mystical thing. I mean, the way that Augustine said he learned Latin because um, Augustine was probably a Berber. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's what I've come to believe. Um, his first language was close, more closely related to Syriac. Really? Well, Syri I mean, Berber is an Afro-Asiatic Afro language, which is in the same family as the Semitic languages, which mm -hmm. includes Arabic, Hebrew, Syriac, Aramaic, the language of Jesus. Also includes ancient Egyptian. Interesting. I didn't know that. And then Berber is another family group in that. But the way he learned Latin was joking around with his friends. No way. That's what he says in the confessions. What? How I mean, did I miss that? So like it's, you can't, you don't know Latin if you just try to read this weird highbrow poetry or uh -huh. read this occasional political speech by Cicero. You gotta, I mean, Latin is a language with everything. Mm -hmm. Consume as much as you can. Yeah. And if someone writes in Latin, especially someone like Augustine, if you, if you can't do it, try and keep trying and you'll eventually get it. Like, yeah. People give their kids books that are a bit too hard for them mm -hmm. and the kids learn. That's so cool. I w at some point I'm going to learn Latin. I don't know how, but I'm going to do it. Um, even if it means just getting one of those like weird, uh, uh, you can read Latin too books uh, and just reading that. Uh, I, I, I advise against that. I say <laughs> learn, learn a few grammar rules, keep it, but jump into the language, read, read the scriptures in Latin. Yeah. Get two birds of one stone. You should read the scriptures more and you should read it in Latin. Just well, learn Latin. I learned uh, in two semesters of Latin, I learned almost zero. And I've gotten uh, a probably, I would say, like uh, 1% into Latin um, just by going to mass in Latin. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, I picked up um, a lot of things, learned a lot of words. Yeah. Um, I can't conjugate anything. Uh, I don't remember any of the declensions that I learned, but I know the words, what the words mean. And if they're put in this order, that it means this. Um, and it's, it's been, uh, that's really the way that I've been, uh, exposed to Latin and, and has some kind of, uh, idea of Latin at all. So just thought that was interesting. It's a marvelous language, has such a rich history. Um, I think if people have the time, they should try to 
figure it out somewhat. There's just yeah. so much good stuff written in Latin. Yeah. I mean, all uh, the vast majority of church documents are written in Latin, too. So if you want to read it in the uh, academic sense. The vast majority of um, scholastic literature is in Latin. Yeah. And the vast all majority of, of that has not been translated. There are there. Are, I just found this out and it really bothered me for some reason. Some of because, uh, as you know, I'm a, more of a Thomist. Um, and so I'm looking at uh, Thomas's uh, works. Mainstream. <laughs> Uh, and I have no problem with that whatsoever. Uh, but the, uh, but Thomas, um, there's some of his works are not translated into English and there's man. some of it that are still in Latin and the, some of the Dominican friars, um, are working on translating them into English right now mm -hmm. and putting them online for free. Um, but I'm like, I can't believe there's like these works that literally almost like there's like a selection of a selection of like 1% of people that are able to read it and even less that are actually going to read it. Yeah. I think that's, uh, what I want to do to help to contribute to the church is, uh, cause it's either everyone needs to learn Latin again, or we need to translate documents. And I yeah. think the latter is probably what's going to happen. And in fact, um, someone introduced me to the, uh, the gospel of, or St. or as Albert the Great's, uh, commentary on the gospel of Mark and told me this has not yet been translated into English. And that's what I'm working on right now. No way. Yeah. That is it's, super it's, cool. It's uh, very difficult. I'm a noob, but so I'm trying to, I think I might make a career out of that. That'd of be super cool. Might help around yeah. church history and whatnot. That'd be awesome. And you'd learn so much just by translating it. Yeah. Um, and, that'd be uh, so cool. Yeah. I think that kind of thing is more useful than uh, writing about some weird poem by a pagan, <laughs> uh, a pagan, uh, horny Latin guy who can't get no girlfriend. Um, Cause you know, there's not just one of them. There are a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> the, it gets really old after the, the fifth or so. And so, you know, yeah, biblical I, commentaries that haven't translated yet or poetry that people can't stop talking about. You know, I, I think I know which one to. Yeah, that'd be really cool. With. Biblical commentaries um, and maybe some of the um, the scholastic works that haven't. Been, there's so many scholastic works that have been translated. I know you're like, yeah, eh, scholastics. No, no. The, the scholastic age is one of the most interesting polemic times of history. Mm. Um, so many different sides like. I'm not saying I'm on a side or another, but it's, it's so interesting. I mean, that's what I, that's what we don't understand. Mm -hmm. Like people call it a dark age. I'm like, oh you don't, you don't know about the intellectual crazy battleground that's been going on for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a, it's such a rich field of history mm -hmm. and, uh, and thought. And then it's nice that it's expanding now to include studies into, um, Islamic and Jewish thought because we're realizing more and more uh, the importance of this influence on Western thought mm -hmm. and how um, different scholars who were outside of Christendom started to come to similar conclusions that we did. Mm. Well, at least in classic thought, I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what well, to, um, to close out, is there any last, uh, like comments or things that anything, last things you would like to say about, uh, Augustine before we close out? Yeah, um, I got this little thing of his on the Psalms from his Enariaciones in Salmos, his expositions on the Psalms. And so in our normal Bible, because the numberings were different back then, this is our Psalm 133 three, three, verse 2. And it's like a fine oil up on the head running down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, upon the color of his robe. And so his, um, his comment on this is barba significat juvenes strenuos impigros alacres ideo quanto tales describimus barbatus homos est dicimus. That means the beard signifies the courageous. The beard distinguishes the grown men, the earnest, the active, the vigorous. So that when we describe such, we say he is a bearded man. And so... That's my apology of the beard. <laughs> it's like, it's why every man should grow a beard, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, I always close out with a Hail Mary. Would you like to lead us uh, in a Hail Mary in Latin? Uh, okay. All right. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. 
Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our to my podcast, Catholic Conversations. Uh, subscribe anywhere that you listen to podcasts, whether that's TuneIn, Stitcher, um, Spotify, or anything else that you listen to. You can find us on any platform in that way. Give us a five-star review. Uh, leave me a uh, review and let me know uh, what you think of the podcast. Or if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, soapboxes, negativities, uh, positivities, or anything in between, you can let me know at production at gmail.com. That's Fonseca production at gmail.com um and you can get talk, contact with me also on social media my uh handle at instagram and twitter is f-f-o-n-z-e that's at f fonzie um so as always have a wonderful and blessed week oh